I'll tell the tale of the Hartley men in the year of 62. T'was on a Thursday morning in the first... On the 8th of July, 1832, during a period of rebellion in the Northumberland and Durham coalfields in the north of England, Cuthbert Skipsey, a striking miner, was shot dead, leaving behind a wife and eight children. The youngest, Joseph, was only three months old. Yet despite having to enter the mines as a child himself, Joseph Skipsey would grow up to become a nationally renowned poet, respected by some of the greatest artists of his time. This is working class literature. It was on a Thursday morning in the first month of the year When there befell an event which well may rend your heart to hear Welcome to episode 2 of the Working Class Literature Podcast. It's been a while since the last episode, so sorry about that. It's uh, been a tough year in terms of work, kids and an international health crisis. In this episode, we'll be discussing the life and work of poet and coal miner Joseph Skipsey. In many ways, Skipsey is emblematic not only of the brutal hardships faced by the Victorian working class, but also of how many often strove to lead creative lives despite those hardships not to mention the beauty they created when they succeeded. I spoke to Chris Harrison and Dr Gordon Tate, who've both been doing lots of work around Joseph Skipsey. Unfortunately, there were some issues with Gordon's sound quality which couldn't be sorted out, so apologies in advance for that. So I'm Chris Harrison. Um, I'm a musician and music educator, and one of the projects that I've embarked upon recently of the last 10 years is to set some of Joseph Skipsey's poems to music uh, as a way of reviving interest in him and re-evaluating and getting a new perspective on his work. And the reason that, um, that I got involved with this in the first place is that Joseph Skipsey was my great-great-grandfather. So uh, um, I'm descended from his eldest uh, daughter. My name's Gordon Tate. I recently finished a PhD in English Literature at Hull University, where I was uh, studying the life, work and letters of the poet Joseph Skipsey. The song at the beginning of this episode was Chris's version of Skipsey's poem, The Hartley Calamity. We'll be playing that, as well as other songs by Chris based on Skipsey's poems, later in the episode. And there'll also be a few more in the bonus episode for patrons. If you want to hear more of Chris's music, check out the links in the show notes. So um, Joseph Skipsey was born in 1832 in the northeast of England in a place called Percy, Maine, which is on Tyneside uh, between Newcastle and um, Tynemouth. And it was uh, very much a mining community. I think the most significant thing, about his life, um, his father was actually killed during the miners' strike of 1832 when he was um, only a few months old, so he never actually knew his father. And it meant that uh, the family was surviving without a main breadwinner. Uh, he had older brothers, but um, uh, at the age of seven, he had to go down and uh, and start working and so he started working underground at the age of seven and the um the 1841 census when he was nine uh is describes him as occupation coal miner and uh that just like to me it says it all it doesn't seem to be anything unusual in somebody recording a nine-year-old as being occupied as a coal miner in fact, he wasn't digging coal at that age, but he was opening and shutting trap doors to let the um, the, the coal trucks through. The first, and he, he entered the pit as a as, for the first time as a, a trapper boy, which w- involved him sitting in darkness for up to sixteen hours a day, opening and closing a wooden door uh, in absolute darkness. Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, in his novel *Sybil or the Two Nations*. Compared this role to solitary confinement, and he wrote, The labour indeed is not severe, for that would be impossible, but it is passed in darkness and in solitude. They endure that punishment which philosophical philanthropy has invented for the direst criminals, and which those criminals deem more terrible than the death for which it is substituted. While he was working in these, in the absolute darkness, um, Skipsy 
managed to teach himself to read and write. He taught himself basically to to read and write, and I think nobody's quite sure exactly what process he went through, but he does talk about practicing writing while he was uh, while he was working underground by chalking things or writing it on the doors in in the coal dust and practicing his his writing. But certainly by the time he was a teenager, he could read and write pretty well. And he was able to tackle the Bible, obviously, uh, um, but also Shakespeare and some of the major poets. From teaching himself how to write against the light of donated candle ends, it was also within the mind that he developed into writing verses. This is an interview he gave to the Palmar Gazette in 1889. And the interviewer said to him, how was your love of poetry awakened? And he says, in those days, this is when he's a young a boy, man, you know, probably around about a teenager. In those days, I didn't know that there was such a thing as poetry. But the elder boys in the pit, the putter lads, as they were called, had a habit of ballad singing. It was seldom that they knew a ballad all through, but they used to sing snatches of ballads and songs at their work, and these fastened themselves in my memory. Their incompleteness dissatisfied me. I wanted them all, and as I could not obtain them, I used to fill them out here and there and piece the fragments together and so give them a completeness of my own. This patching of old ballads was my first effort at verse-making. And then the interviewer says, and what was the next step? And he said, well, the next step was the composition of new words to the old tunes. I do not doubt at this day that the lilt of the old ballads has given me a tone to whatever music my verse may be supposed to possess. Um, so that's quite a clear routine that he's he's heard ballads and songs being sung, um, and the people who are singing them didn't know them all the way through, and he's realised that he can fashion them into uh, complete stories, and then that he doesn't have to actually use the old the old words as a basis for what he does. He can make up completely new ballads, and the. Um, the connection between poetry and music is very clear all the way through his, his writing. This musical influence can be seen in the titles of his published collections of poetry, such as Carol Songs and Ballads, a book of miscellaneous lyrics, and Carols from the Coalfields. But Skipsy's poetry would also be informed by the wide breadth of his reading, which was incredible by any standards, but even more so given the many obstacles in his way. So Skipsy's poetry is, is informed by... His reading, um, it's informed by Paradise Lost, it's informed by Shakespeare, it's informed by even, even Wordsworth, um, the great canon of English literature. But in these references that he uses, these are often outdated in a way. He, does, he doesn't have access to the absolute contemporary high culture. And as a result, his writing can seem a little archaic. The critic Jonathan Rose describes this as a cultural lag where working class artists and writers only had access to cultural artefacts that were deemed out of date, that were deemed unfashionable. A working class writer may only have access to a volume of poetry that, or a volume of criticism even that may be 50, 60 years old because that is because it's become sufficiently cheap. One poet who readers often compared Skipsy to, or who they claimed he was influenced by, was the canonical romantic poet William Blake. Oscar Wilde, for example, said Blake and Skipsy shared a metrical affinity and a marvellous power for making simple things seem strange to us and strange things seem simple. In our bonus episode, we go into a little bit more detail about the similarities between Blake and Skipsy, as well as their shared relationship to John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost. Arguably Skipsy's most famous poem, however, is The Hartley Calamity, inspired by the shocking events of the Hartley Colliery disaster of 1862. It, the, the Hartley Calamity, referred to in the, in the poem and the song, took place in January 1862, um, there was, uh, there had been a new beam installed, um, to work the, um, 
the, the 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 mechanism that brought the miners up and down the mine shaft um, to and from work, uh, and that cast iron beam snapped and fell into the shaft and blocked it uh, at a time when there were two hundred miners underground. This resulted in hundreds of tons of debris falling into the pit and blocking the shaft. This pit had only one shaft, so there was only one way for the men to escape. That there was only one shaft had been recognised as a danger for centuries, but because it was economically more expensive to sink a second shaft, the the common practice was to sink just one. It was an event which caused shockwaves throughout the region and um, actually throughout the country because it was the, the biggest uh, loss of life um, at the time. Uh, and of course it was avoidable because uh, and, and this is a, it's, it's a health and safety issue. There was only one way in and out of the, out of the mine, only one shaft. And when that um, was uh, blocked, um, there was, the miners were just trapped. The reason there wasn't a second shaft was because the people who owned the mines wanted to maximize their profits and didn't want to put some of the profits into um, providing an alternative. The miners weren't crushed by falling rock or anything. They just suffocated to death. And by the time the rescue parties could get down to them, um, they, they had died. Obviously, it was foul air and gas and everything down there which, which um, contributed. The Skipsy used to recite this at um, at events which were held, but sort of benefit events to ra- to help raise money for the bereaved families. And descriptions of how he uh, recited it were ob- you know, it was obviously a very powerful um, rec- recitation. Uh, this is Skip- this is Spence Hodgson writing about Skipsy saying. Um, uh, when on rare occasions he recited the Hartley Pit Calamity to a large audience, the emotion it awakened was almost painful to witness. I think I've never known a reader, reciter or actor who could be compared with him for his power over words. That's Spence Watson, Skipsy's friend, writing about him. In a moment, we're going to listen to Chris's reworking of Skipsy's poem. In it, we see the sweat and dirt of mining work interrupted suddenly by the shock of disaster. As mentioned before, the 200 men and boys, some of them as young as 10, suffocated to death, and Skipsy, who himself had worked the mines as both an adult and a child, ends his poem recording how sons died alongside their fathers, with lines like, Sleep, my son, close by I'll stay, and a watch over thee I'll keep. To stay awake the father strives, but he knows he too must sleep. As Chris explains, the vividness of the poem is no doubt the result of Skipsy's own experiences down the mines himself. One of the differences between Skipsy's poem and other mining disaster poems, which of which there are quite a number, um, that he actually tells the story from the inside. And he does that, of course, because he could, because he was a miner and so he imagines um how how they felt while they were trapped underground and that's what makes it such a harrowing story that they start off sort of they're shocked and then they're full of hope and determination and they start hacking away and digging away and at one point they think they might hear noise outside and that people are going to get through and then it goes to despair because there's a second um a second not explosion but a second fall of some sort and then they start again and off they go and then can't get anywhere and eventually it's like resignation and despair and they just have to to give up and uh, and i'm in the scenes where they uh, where where they they know they um they're gonna have to as they call it, they're, they're, gonna, they're not going to be able to stay awake and they just pass the, the responsibility on to other people near them. It's, it's just terribly, it's harrowing. The Hartley men are noble and he'll hear a tale of woe. I'll tell the tale of the Hartley men in the year of 62. It was on a Thursday morning in the first 
first month of the year. And there befell an event which well may rend your heart to hear. Before the day when most folk lay still sleeping in their beds, the Hartley men are a band off to earn their daily bread. Toil in heat they broil and streams of sweat soon glue the stour to their skins till they are black as the coal they hew and back and forth the putters go the wagons to and fro and clang and clang of wheel on hoof bring in the mine below the din and strife of human life awake in board and wall when suddenly they feel a shock and terror grips them all each bosom thuds as each is duds he snatches and away Towards the distant shaft he flees with all the speed he may. They flee, they flee by two, by three, towards the shaft and seek an answer in each other's face for what they dare not speak. Are we entombed? They seem to ask, for the shaft is blocked and no. Escape have we to God's bright day from out the night below. So stand in pain the hardly men, and swiftly o'er them comes fond thoughts of their families and memories of their homes. Despair at length renews their strength, for they the shaft must clear. And soon the sound of mal and pick drowns out the voice of fear. And hark to the blow of the mal below, do sounds above reply. Hurrah, hurrah for the hardly men, for now their rescue's nigh. A further rumble shakes the mine and drives them to despair. Yet as they kneel again, they feel their strength renewed again. The ring and swing of the mal attest the might of the hardly men. And hark to the blow of the mal below, do sounds above reply. Hurrah, hurrah for the Hartley men, for now their rescue's nigh. But the beam that collapsed has blocked the shaft, there's nowhere left to crawl. And one by one the lights go out, and darkness covers all. Dear Father, till the shaft is cleared, close beside me keep. My strength is gone, my eyes are tired, I know that I must sleep. Oh sleep, my son, close by I'll stay, and a watch o'er thee I'll keep. To stay awake, the father strives, but he knows he too must sleep. Dear brother, till the shaft is cleared, close beside us keep. My strength is gone, my eyes are tired, I know that I must sleep. Sleep, brother, sleep, close by I'll stay, and a watch o'er the I'll keep. To stay awake, the brother strives, but he knows he too will. So 
down below the Hartley men prepared to meet their fate. While up above by the black pit heap, people could only wait. And fathers, brothers, sisters, mothers, the lover and the new made bride. A vigil kept for those who slept from eve to morning tide. Yet still they sleep in silent dread, two hundred old and young, to awake when heaven and earth have sped, and the final trumpet rung. Events such as the Hartley Calamity, in which 204 men were killed, were thankfully rare in the mining industry. Uh, the, the Hartley Calamity itself remains England's most devastating mining accident. What was more prevalent amongst the mining, mining communities was the staggering level of accidents that claimed lives in ones or twos, or or made men economically inactive through injury for periods of time or, or perhaps even permanently. One commentator described this uh, this phenomenon as being a colliery, colliery disaster in instalments. The statistics surrounding injuries and deaths that occurred in Britain's coal mines are staggering. One historian has pointed out that between 1868 and 1919, a miner was killed every six hours. Another was seriously injured every two hours. Another injured badly enough to need a week off work every two or three minutes. But when you see when you see staggering statistics like that, or when you read staggering statistics like that, it's easy to see why miners would often be considered as hard drinking, as living for the moment, because they might never they might actually never see tomorrow. You know, if they go to work, they may not come home again. There's a, a, a song by another coal miner poet from the northeast called Tommy Armstrong, who wrote the poem The Trimden Grange Explosion shortly after an explosion at Trimden Grange Colliery, where he wrote, where the opening lines read, Let us not think of tomorrow, lest we disappointed be. All our joys may turn to sorrow, as we all may daily see. Despite all this, Skipsy's poetry, aside from occasional exceptions such as Downfall of Mammon and Reign of Gold, tended to stay away from overtly political subjects, as Gordon here explains. Many mining communities only existed for the fact that they were built, they rose up around the mine itself. So in a way, it's very, very difficult for miners, individual miners, to actually criticise the mining industry, because in doing so, they, they're putting their livelihood at risk. And many of the early mine worker leaders, union leaders in the Northeast, somebody to people like Thomas Hepburn, for example, once tracks were finished with, they were made examples of. They were refused work. They were isolated from communities. And Thomas Hepburn um, became a travels, traveling salesman in the end. As a result, somebody like Joseph Skipsey it's, it's very difficult for him to, to criticise the exploitation of, of people within my, the mining industry. But this difficulty wasn't just a personal perspective, a personal attitude. Um, it was also a, a, an attitude that was fostered through his own poetry writing. A lot of, in some of his early reviews, Skipsy's reviewers, which was the only real access that he had to a literary community to be able to improve his poetry. He wasn't surrounded by a literary network. He was he was pretty much working in isolation. And in early reviews, some of the reviewers dissuaded him from writing on more political subjects. And this seems to have affected Skipsy's writing in later life. The overtly political is removed from Skipsy's poetry. You know, there are a lot of other um, contemporaries of his that were Pittman or working class poets 
and uh, um, there was you know, Geordie Ridley who wrote The Bladen Races, there's Joe Wilson who wrote Keep Your Feet Still, Geordie Hinney, there's Tommy Armstrong who was born a little bit later and lived a bit, lived in Durham, but um, or County Durham, uh, who wrote a lot of ballads about you know, strikes and pit life and whatever. And Skipsy's a, a, he's, he's not so much one of them in a way. Um, he doesn't, he, he doesn't, um, he's more concerned with creating something that he thinks of as poetic. And, and sometimes I suppose that, that dulls the message, although I'm not sure that he would see it like that. And, uh, and, um, yeah, I'm not sure. But, but certainly he's more, he's more concerned to be a poet. Than a, than a chronicler of working class life. Although he was very often referred to as the Pittman poet or the Pittman poet of Percy Maine, it, you know, which trips nicely off the tongue. Actually, he just wanted to, he wanted people to say, look, you're a poet, and that's it. As such, Skipsy's poetry covered a range of themes as well as those related to mining. Yeah, there's quite a lot about um, domestic life and uh, sort of courtship and relationships between uh, between men and women and young men and young women. Uh, th there's a section of the poems which uh, which are sort of spiritual, I suppose. He often refers to them as psychic poems. Um, he doesn't deal a lot directly with uh, with mining life with with um, and with actual life down the mines. So the the Hartley calamity that that is the one um, poem which which really talks about uh, disaster down the mine. Although there's another one called Bereaved, which um, relates to uh, people losing their lives underground. And there's one, um, yeah, there's there's a few. There's a select few. Get Get Up, which is a great poem, um, which just uh, is. Um, R reminds people of the ever-present danger of working down the mine and the fact that people who worked underground were always, were always aware of it. As has often been said, the personal is indeed very much political. As such, distinctly social themes come through even in Skipsy's personal poems about miners' domestic lives. The poem Get Up, just mentioned by Chris and which we'll listen to now, is one such example. Get up, the caller cries, get up, and in the dead of night, to win the bends their bite and sup, I rise a weary white. My flannel dudden donned, thrice sore I kiss the bends, and then... With a sigh I close the door, I may not open again. In these two stanzas, Skipsy depicts a powerful scene. His miner is awoken by the caller whose job it was to go round the village waking miners for their shift. The miner gets dressed, kisses his children and leaves for work. But as he does so, Skipsy closes the poem with the thought that he may never return to see the family for whom he goes to work. Given what Gordon said earlier about a miner dying at work every six hours in Britain around this period, the social significance of this highly personal scene is obvious. Get Up is also the first in a series of poems which, though never intended as a coherent sequence, Gordon explained that they could be read together as recreating the miner's day. Unfortunately, we lost this bit because of audio issues, so I'll do my best to capture it here. Basically, after Get Up, the sequence moves through another four poems. The stars are twinkling, A Golden Lot, Willie to Ginny, and Oh Sleep. So after the miner gets up, in The Stars Are Twinkling, we follow him as he looks at the stars during his journey from home to the pit. The stars are twinkling in the sky. As to the pit I go, I think not of the sheen on high, but of the gloom below. No rest, no peace, 
But toil and strife do there the soul enthrall and turn the precious cup of life into a cup of gold. The stars are twinkling in the sky as to the pit I go I think not of the sheen on high But of the gloom below No rest, no peace But toil and strife Do there the soul enthrall And turn the pressure Next is a golden lot. Here the gloom below returns as the gloom of the deep, deep mine. But rather than vivid descriptions of mining labour itself, Skipsy describes how music and poetry allow him to escape, psychologically at least, from the grind of manual labour. As the reality of work dieth away, his lot is transformed from gloom into gold. And a golden lot is mine Next, in Willie to Ginny, Skipsy depicts a miner's safe return home, closing the poem with his wife's perspective that nothing dark could Ginny see a coming from the colliery. Yet even here, the threat of tragedy is ever present. Willie's return home is shot through with the relief of seeing nothing dark, that is, news of injury or death, returning from the mine. The flip side of this, obviously, is the daily fear of seeing something dark a possibility which actually forms the basis of a fatal errand, another of Skipsy's poems, in which news is delivered of a death down the mine. Nothing dark could Ginny see A coming from the colliery Finally, in O Sleep, we see a mother rocking her baby. Oh, sleep, my little baby, thou wilt wake thy father with thy cries, and he into the pit must go before the sun begins to rise oh, sleep, my little baby. Rest then is brief, precarious and ultimately interrupted by the mine itself and in its mention of going to the pit before the sun begins to rise O oh, Sleep links itself to the dead of night mentioned in Get Up and so, like the miner's day itself, the sequence begins all over again. In these poems, then, work is figured as a constant antagonistic and even threatening presence throughout the miner's daily life, from the moment they get out of bed until they go back to sleep. Despite Skipsy's avoidance of overtly political matters, the fact that his poetry's personal scenes open up such clearly social themes show that no neat separation between the two is really possible. Skipsy would likely have remained a purely local poet had it not been for his association with a group of artists called the Pre-Raphaelites. But Skipsy's connection to the Pre-Raphaelites was only made possible by the efforts of a Sunderland court car called Thomas Dixon. So Thomas, Thomas Dixon was, uh, was something of a pest to a number of people. He was a cork cutter in Sunderland, in the northeast of England. 
and he utilised the changes in the postal service to write to anybody and everybody he felt he had any kind of affinity with. Thomas Dixon crossed class boundaries with impunity. He didn't seem to care. The, 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 name, the stature of the individual he was he was writing to, he just he just wanted a shared interest. That was enough for him to be able to write to anyone. He had far-ranging interests from politics to art, and communicated with such people as John Ruskin, the famous art critic, and, and even got the offer of painting lessons from John Everett Millet, the famous pre-Raphaelite painter. As a result of his of this letter writing, he he became notorious. Really, he was in communication with people like Dante Gabriel Rossetti and persisted in communication with these people, often even if they didn't want it. The poet Robert Browning was one such person who didn't appreciate this kind of cross-class correspondence. In a letter to his friend and fellow writer William Rossetti, Browning wrote, From time to time I receive letters from Thomas Dixon, 57 Nile Street, Sunderland, who chooses to write them and embarrass me. He sends books as presents, thinking there is a lack of that commodity in London, apparently. I am in no condition to guess whether he knows you or does not, whether you will be pleased with his loan or bothered, as I own myself to be. I pass on the thing to you. What you will do in turn I shall not concern myself with. Only, I entreat, do not return them to me. Aside from his assistance to Skipsy at a crucial time in his career, Thomas Dixon led a very active life. He campaigned for safety in the shipping industry, developed cultural institutions in his native Sunderland, and is credited with introducing the work of legendary American poet Walt Whitman to the United Kingdom. We talk a little bit more about Thomas Dixon in the bonus episode, available now for patrons. It was through Dixon that Skipsy made his connection to the Pre-Raphaelites. So the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, as they were initially known, was a, a group of artists working in the mid-19th century who sought to change the conventions of Victorian art by having an absolute dedication to an absolute accuracy in their representation. The three main artists of the group were William Holman Hunt, John Everett Millet, and Dante Gabriel Rossetti. These three artists were something something of the bad boys of Victorian art, Dante Gabriel Rossetti in particular. And they kind of they changed they changed the Victorian painting quite significantly. Thomas Dixon introduced Skipsy's poetry to this circle. He sent copies of uh, Skipsy's 1878 book, Mis- Miscellaneous Lyrics, to Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Rossetti was particularly complimentary about Skipsy's poems, and in one letter described Skipsy's poem, Get Up, as equal to anything in the language for di- direct and quiet pathetic force. The introduction to Rossetti would have a profound impact on Skipsy's career. Prior to being introduced to Rossetti, he was limited to that of a local poet who had had some national reviews. After the introduction to Rossetti, Skipsy was exposed to a literary circle that was beyond what he could have imagined. And the influence of of, of Rossetti and his group of friends and fellow artists was... Uh, was unreal for a working man. Skipsy's association with the Pre-Raphaelites would be life-changing. Following his introduction to Rossetti, Skipsy's career moved to a different level. He became someone who was known nationally. He was reviewed in publications such as the Athenaeum, which was the an influential art and literature paper from the, at the end of the 19th century. And he was always received positively. And it is this, this access that... This, and it is the access to an extended literary network that enabled Skipsy to develop as a poet, to gain a wider readership, to gain a more influential readership. And it is largely for his connections to Rossetti that Skipsy is remembered today. Without that connection to this literary elite, it seems in all likelihood that Skipsy would have been, or would have fallen into obscurity like so many other working class writers, poets and artists. Within two years of, of having met Rossetti, the Skipsy had left mining completely. Once he became known as a, as a poet, 
people tried to persuade him to uh, to find work that was less onerous, um, work where he might have a bit more time to to write poetry. Um, he got a job as an under storekeeper in the ironworks in Gateshead, uh, and he was there for about four years. But that, um, well, actually, what happened was one of his children was killed in an accident there, and uh, he found it too sad a place to stay, so that he went back to, to mining and remained there until the 1880s. Um, there were times when people... Uh, again, tried to um, offer him other other work. He he, he became li under librarian at the Newcastle Literary and Philosophical Society um, for a while, but it didn't pay very much. And I think the, the story seems to be that he was so interested in all the books there, you can imagine it would be paradise for him, um, that he didn't like serving the customers or doing the, the menial work around the place. Um so in 1882, I think, yes, at the age of 50, he got a job at, uh, at a, as a school, a schoolkeeper, we call it now, uh, in Newcastle. And that was so uh, he actually left mining at the age of 50. But we have to remember that at the age of 50, he'd already been working in coal mines for 43 years. So um, he became a schoolkeeper and, uh, and that that was that that probably was good for him in the sense that in the 1880s he did he was more active he published some volumes of poetry and he was asked to edit um collections of other poets um for a for a sort of um an edition which was uh the the the, the purpose of it was to make poetry accessible to um, less well-off people, so they were sort of editions that you could buy relatively cheaply. And he was the he edited volumes by Coleridge and Shelley and Burns and Blake and Poe. So, and those those obviously are important poets, and he knew their work pretty well. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, and then the most extraordinary thing, I think, was that when the schoolkeeping work became a bit much. For, for him and his wife. They were recommended for the job of uh, curators of the Shakespeare Birthplace Museum in Stratford-on-Avon. And it is an extraordinary episode. He got as many, many letters of uh, commendation um, from, and, and the list of recommendations reads like sort of who's who of Victorian literature and, and the arts. Indeed, some of the famous names to send recommendations on Skipsy's behalf were Oscar Wilde, William Morris, Bram Stoker, Alfred Tennyson and Robert Browning, not to mention many others. And he got the job and they went down to Stratford and he stayed there for about two years between 1890 and 1892. In the end, um, he became a bit disillusioned about the nature of the work. Uh, I think he'd thought he would be able to have learned conversations with, with visitors about fine points of Shakespeare's writing, uh, and it didn't quite work out like that, you know, being a more of a, a tourist guide, let's say. Um, so in the end, in 1892, he resigned and came back up to the northeast. He, he actually, I don't, I don't know if he'd lived completely on his own means, but he was, he did have an independent income from that time, by that time from the government, his, his work was recognised. Uh, and he got a small annuity. So he lived another 10 years in a sort of retirement. Uh, another thing which I think should mention, I mean, uh, it's uh, sadly not probably untypical in Victorian life, is that um, five of his eight children died in uh, before they reached adulthood. And that was in the... Um, uh, 1860s. Uh, one of them, as I mentioned, was was killed in an accident at the ironworks, um, and three of them died in a, in a, um, a scarlet fever epidemic. So at one time, having had six children, um, at the end of the 1860s, he was left with only, or he and his wife were left with only one child. His eldest daughter, Elizabeth, who was my great-grandmother, 
they went on to have two more um, boys. And so they had three children who survived them. But again, that is a big um, shock uh, in your life that that five five of your children should should die within a relatively short space of time. He had a hard life, didn't he? So, uh, but but I, yeah, he he probably was a serious um, a serious minded person. Also, I mean, to have that determination to teach yourself to read to educate yourself to um to to, to write the poetry uh, and to um to publicize it and you know to to be your own agent in a way um to do all that is, is very very it's, it's a very strong determination isn't it Skipsy's writing career also highlights some of the difficulties which working class writers have to navigate between the labels of their class and artistic activity Issues which exist just as much for a podcast called Working Class Literature as much as anything else, to be honest. When Joseph Skitzi wrote his first uh, his first collection of poetry, he published it as a, under the pseudonym of uh, J. S. a coal miner. And in this very in his very first in the very first review of that text, he was he was then given the label Pitman Poet. But this idea of the Pitman Poet is both recognition and a trap. So the, the working class writer, the, the Pittman poet in this instance, is trapped within a set of conventions, a set, a set of expectations, and they, they must write within the community from which they, they come from, the industry which they belong to. Um, and these are a set of expectations that wouldn't necessarily be placed on a writer from a middle class background or a, a different class background. In doing so, the working class writer was denied access to the universal range of human emotions, the universal human experience. So exploring the, the wide range of human thought and feeling isn't, isn't necessarily available to those who've got the prefix of their under industrial label. One Scottish miner who was also a poet and became an MP, James Welsh, noted in his in the preface to his Songs of a Minor in 1918 that he rather disliked the fact that there was a tendency already in some quarters to dub me a minor poet. Minor I am, poet I may be, but let the world not think there is virtue in the combination. Plowman poets, navvy poets, minor poets appeal only to the superficialities of life. The poet aims at its elementals. And in the label, it's the elementals that are withdrawn from the working class poets. So even in positive re- reviews of Skipsy's poems, poems on speculative or imaginative subjects are ignored. Skipsy himself wrote about this to his friend Thomas Dixon, and he said, none of our reviewers, not even the Athenaeum, have given a critique of the philosophical poems which occupy for one half of the book. That's miscellaneous lyrics published in 1878. So here, Skipsy is complaining that even in a, even in a review that is heavily weighted in favour of him, the reviewer is unable to recognise poems outside of that narrow definition of what a Pitman poet should write. However, as Chris explains, issues of class and artistry in many ways are impossible to separate. I mean, there's also a sort of dilemma between you don't want to pigeon him as a as a as a Pittman poet or a working class writer or whatever, but on the other hand, he is a working class writer, and the fact that as a member of the Victorian working class, he was able to achieve what he did is just tremendously significant and needs to be validated and recognised. So, uh, so the origins have to be, we have to be aware of them. They have to come into the discussion. They have to be part of the equation. The fact that he, that he wrote at all, the fact that somebody could come out of these circumstances, uh, that he was born into and succeed in becoming, um, a poet and a good poet and a nationally recognized poet. I think it's a testament to his humanity, to his creativity, and to his aspiration. And uh, although the poems stand up for themselves, I think if we read them in that context, we're also becoming aware of the importance of them. The hardly men are noble, and you'll hear a tale of woe. I'll tell the tale of the hardly men.
That's all we've got time for in this episode. If you want to know more about Joseph Skipsey, you can check out the links in the show notes below. We've also got more info on Skipsey's life, Chris's music, and stories of Thomas Dixon's various shenanigans in the bonus episode, available for patrons now. Patrons also have access to a guide of suggested readings on the rich tradition of miners' literature from the northeast of England. If you enjoyed the show, do consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash workingclassliterature. And if you can't give us any money just now, don't worry, a five-star review on your favourite podcast app would be much appreciated. That's all for now, and hopefully you'll be hearing from us again soon.